Hey folks, welcome to Atomic Game Theory, the show that uses conflict theory and math to study the tiny decisions that can make big differences between winning and losing your favorite games. Wizards of the Coast recently released their newest set of Magic the Gathering, Conspiracy Take the Crown. The Conspiracy sets are unique in Magic because they focus on the mechanics of drafting. A live draft is one of my favorite ways to play Magic, and so I decided to honor Conspiracy by focusing on one of the infamous components of the game, Hate Drafting. While games like Sushi Go and Seven Wonders are built solely around the draft, Magic the Gathering is based around drafting in order to create a tournament deck. So the draft is like a little mini-game before the actual game, but drafting well is really important to doing well in the tournament. In a regular draft, each player gets three packs of Magic cards. When the game starts, each player picks one of those packs, opens it up, picks one card, and then passes the rest of the pack to their left. Once those cards are gone, everyone opens up a new pack and the play continues. By the end of it, everyone's going to have 45 cards that they're going to narrow down into 22 cards or so. They're going to add some land and make a brutally efficient deck. Now there are a lot of guidelines for how to draft. Generally, players pick one or two colors, and they try to pick the best cards they can out of those colors. So when you open that fresh pack of cards, which one should you take? Say you're drafting red and blue. You could take the best red or blue card you could find, or... You can try to help yourself by hurting your opponents. What if I'm looking at a pack of cards and all the good cards are in the wrong colors? Should I pick a weak card that works with my colors, or should I pick a great card even if I can't use it, just so no one else can have it? Which of those is the strongest move? I think we should get some serious analysis on the benefits of hate drafting. To get started, I need a model so that I can develop some utility values. We're about to make some serious assumptions and oversimplifications to illustrate a point, so focus on the big picture here. Magic the Gathering is a game filled with small rules and exceptions, which make the game far too tricky for us to analyze in a five minute video. Which is good, that's what makes the game fun. Okay, let's assume that a pack of cards comes with one rare card, three uncommons, ten commons, and one, like, random foil card. L let's not do that. Sometimes rares are good, but sometimes they are terrible. So instead of building this model based on rarity, let's do it based on usefulness of the cards. Say that one card in the pack is great, it's perfect for a deck, it's the kind of card someone would use as the foundation for a deck. And let's say that three cards in the pack are good, they're solid cards that you need as the major support of your deck. If the great card defines your deck, a good card does the heavy lifting. Finally, the other ten cards are just okay. They're not the most exciting cards in the pack, but you need them to fill out your deck. Yes, we're saying that the usefulness of the cards exists at the same ratio as the rarity of the cards. But sometimes, one of the uncommons is the best card in the pack, so let's just go with it. I asked some Magic players about how I should scale the usefulness of the cards, and we felt like 1, 4, and 10 was a simple yet meaningful way to look at the problem. So this model has allowed me to place utility values on the cards in the pack, but how likely is it for me to draw one of the great cards that fits my colors? While some folks play one or three color decks, I've usually had the most fun with two colors. And if we ignore artifacts or dual colored cards or any of those things, the chance of any given card being my color is 40%. If we assume that the three good cards have to be different colors, then there are 10 possible ways to create groups of three colors. Given that I'm looking for red or blue cards, there is only one of these combinations which does not include my colors. So I have a 90% chance to find a good card. And in the event that there isn't a better quality card to pick, there will certainly be a card of your color among the remaining 10. We can create a decision tree to see how this all plays out. First up, there is either a great card for me, or there isn't. If there isn't, there's either a good or an okay card. 40% of the great cards are useful, so that's a 60% chance of not having a great card for me. We also said that there's a 90% chance of having a good card. But as we move down the branches of a decision tree, we multiply percentages together. Which means that 54% of the time I end up with a good card. Which gives us a 6% chance that we're left with something okay. Double checking our work, that all adds up to 100%. Good work, me. Given those odds, I should be able to calculate an expected value for my first draft in that pack. For our calculations, we multiply the probability of an outcome occurring with the utility of that outcome. In this case, we have the odds of drafting a great, good, or okay card all added together to get a final result. In a fresh pack, I should get a utility of 6.2 with my initial draft. First pick is absolutely worth it. If I pass the pack on to you, things are different for your second pick. I could have taken the best card, but 54% of the time I had to take a good card, so the great one is still there. Overall, for your second pick, the expected value decreases to 3.5. My draft experience is way better than yours, giving me a difference of 2.7. I love it, but are there strategies that increase my utility even more? 
For example, I could simply take the best card in the pack. That's called hate drafting. Sometimes folks call this rare drafting and force everyone to take the rare with their first pick, but that can put some people in some pretty unstrategic positions. When I decide to hate draft, I take the best card. That's the only rule. 40% of the time it's great for me, but if it isn't, I take someone else's great card instead, which doesn't benefit me at all. That gives me an expected value of 4.0. By penalizing myself, I slightly increase the expected value of whoever gets my pack next. So your expected value actually increases to 3.7, which leaves my overall benefit at only 0.3. Not so great. To recap, if I draft on my first pick, I get an expected value of 6.2, and you have an expected value of 3.5 on the second pick. Benefit to me is 2.7. And if I hate draft on my first pick, the difference is significantly smaller, and I only end up with a benefit of 0.3. So what happens when everybody hate drafts? Let's set up a matrix to consider the probabilities. I'm going to focus here on the expected values of my drafts. This matrix is me versus my opponents. On my first pick, I gain 6.2 utility with option 1, while hate drafting only gives me 4.0. Depending on what my opponents did, I can consider my second pick. If my opponents focused on their own utility, I get a pack with an expected value of 3.5. Meanwhile, if they hate drafted, I have a 3.7 instead. When we total our drafts, it's clear that the bigger numbers come when I draft for utility. My opponents want to minimize my utility scores, so they're looking for the smallest numbers which are on the left side. The top left corner where everyone drafts for utility is the clear equilibrium. Okay, sure. But people talk about hate drafting all the time. Isn't there any moment when it's actually useful? Absolutely. First up is when the stakes get low. The fourth pick of the draft is when all the good cards usually vanish. So my expected value is pretty low. In fact, it's so low that the fifth pick is basically the exact same value. On the other hand, if I take the last good card, I leave my opponent with nothing but filler. And that seems useful to me. I mean, it's less utility, but my opponent bottoms out at a utility of one. Finally, a benefit for me, even if it's pretty conditional. So what are our conclusions from this pile of formulas? You should hate draft when the stakes are low and you can deny something to your opponents. The fourth round of a draft is a good moment, but so is any time when you don't have any meaningful options. That's when your own personal utility is bottomed out. And of course, you can hate draft if you can gain useful information about what your opponents are going to do. If you have an option that will certainly deny them utility, that changes everything. Pay attention to what people say and what colors your opponents pass you. If you can quickly figure out what colors your opponents are playing, then you can punish them with hate drafting. Of course, if you're not up for being cruel, just play your own game and leave hate for the haters. Those are my tips. So now go out and draft the new magic set, Conspiracy Take the Crown, at your favorite local gaming store. Call ahead and find out when the drafts are and think carefully about how you want to draft. Do you want to make the best deck you can, or do you mix things up by taking all the cards your opponents want? How do they respond? And in the end, does your drafting strategy affect your chances for victory in the game? And now you're thinking like a game theorist. This has been your atomic look inside hate drafting in Magic the Gathering. Thanks for watching.